that is what happens in the naive continuum limit when you write down hydrodynamic equations all that means is x and uh, therefore rho x is a function of a continuous variable. But in statistical continuum limit this field rho x or phi of x it is these there are fluctuations in the field phi okay and the fluctuations uh, there are continuous number of them I mean in the sense x is continuous so at you have a degree of freedom at each point x each each degree is fluctuating and you want to take the limit where the spacing between neighboring points goes to 0. So, it is a, a bit more tricky than the naive continuum limit where you just have a variable a function of x and x is becoming here you have variables defined at each x and then you are taking the continuum limit. So, it is essentially you have end up having an infinite number of degrees of freedom. So, that is what he calls the statistical continuum limit and again to make this point between the difference between this kind of problem and uh, what we call the hydrodynamic problem is that if you are writing down a hydrodynamic equation. So, you have a wave water wave or a wave on a string or something there is typically it is it is written in a you write it in a continuum where x is continuous, but there is some wavelength for instance for that hydrodynamic wave which is important. So, there is one scale which is lambda the wavelength. So, that is one length scale in the problem which is a wavelength, but in this situation you do not have one length scale you have a continuum of length scales which means all wavelengths are important ok. It is not just one wavelength. So, that is the main difference between just studying hydrodynamics and doing critical phenomena. It is not one scale that is important, but all scales. So, if you have a uh, size of the box all wavelengths from 0 to the size of the box are all important for the problem at hand it is not just one wavelength ok. So, there is no one way uh, length scale that you have to worry about. So, it is this lack of separation of scales that is the root of the problem in critical phenomena ok. So, this this point will be we will keep com coming up with this as we do the analysis um, yeah. So, here because of this issue you have to understand what you mean by locality. How do you guarantee that your equations are going to be local on some length scale? If all scales are going to be coupled, there is no natural length scale over which you should coarse grain and get local equations. So, the issue of maintaining locality will come up again and again. I mean, in, in, in fact, it is an assumption in the renormalization group that you should, I mean, you, that you can maintain locality at some scale uh, throughout the operation. And uh, without that assumption, you you won't be able to make any progress. Okay, so we'll keep. I, I'll mention that when I do the uh, write down the equations. I'm just making some general points here. Okay, so this is. So I've told you when R G is important, and I said main point is this: when there's no separation of scales, all length scales are important, and you have a large number of degrees of freedom. So now I'm going to tell you just outline what are the steps involved. Basically, okay. Um, so there are basically two things, but maybe I should stop and ask if there are any questions about any of this. So we'll come back. Yeah. Statistical. Okay, that, that's in statistical mechanics or in field theory. Phi of x is a, is your variable. Okay. And at every point it is an independent variable. So, you have to worry about fluctuations of each of these fields and and worry about the fact that the two uh, x's are coming arbitrarily close. You have two fields degrees of freedom which are arbitrarily close but fluctuating independently ok. So, that is a little different from the hydrodynamic situation where you do not worry about fluctuations. You have a well defined equation that you have to solve and it has a it is just a function. So, here you have a every point you have a in, uh, fluctuating variable. So, it is a much more complicated limit that you have to take. Any other questions? Yes. Yes, you will. 
So you will summarize that information in some parameters which describe the physics at the long length scale. So in principle you lose, so actually I should mention at this point that is a good question. So the idea of the exact RG is that you do not lose information, you somehow keep all the information. So, yeah, it is an exact transformation, okay. So uh, whether it is a useful thing or not is a different question, but the exact RG is reversible, you can go backwards and forwards, okay. But, so that is, uh, yeah, but in general you will, you, you will, okay, see, you have to realize one thing, what, what the RG does is it sort of organizes the information in a way in which the most important thing stares at you in the face, the less important things are less imp show up in a, in a uh, less important way and it automatically separates the important from the unimportant thing. So if you choose to keep all the unimportant degrees of freedom, then you have all the information. You have the option of throwing away that unimportant information and getting most of the things out. That is typically what you would do in practice, okay. But in principle, the exact RG does it exactly, keeps everything, does not lose information. Okay. So, what are the steps of? Uh, yes. Well, it's not. I don't know what you mean. Multiply. You, you, you can. Um, the RG transformation is a fairly complicated transformation, which takes the action from one action, one form of the action to other. And you can. So there's a flow. You can flow backwards or forwards. That's all it's saying. So uh, maybe it'll become clear when we do it. Okay. So what are we saying now? Uh, yeah. So the two things, uh, as I said, one thing is when you have a large number of degrees of freedom, what you do. So what, what it does is, uh, first step is to uh, reduce okay. so, uh, what we did here was to just take a simple average and call it rho of x. That's what works in hydrodynamics. What the RG does is it does it in a more sophisticated way and uh, keeps track of more information. So what you do, so this is done in a systematic way. So what you do is. Um, so imagine you have a lattice with some spacing which is say L0 simple example what uh, just to illustrate what RG does so what it will do for instance is to take so these are you can think of these as lattice points and there's a spin on each lattice which is spin could be up or down or whatever the microscopic details then what you do is you uh, change, you do some kind of an averaging so that after the, uh, and, and there is some, some change of variables and so on that you do, so that after this transformation, the length scale L0 has changed to 2L0, okay. So you do, so you change your length scale in the problem. That means if initially you had a lattice with spacing L0, you somehow change it, change the problem by doing some kind of an averaging. So that now the spacing is 2L0. So you have a Hamiltonian with in which the spacing is L0. Now you have a new Hamiltonian where the spacing is 2L0 with some different parameters. And you repeat this process and you can go so many steps. When do you stop? How, 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 how far should you go? when you hit the correlation length, right. So you stop and this is of order correlation length. But I don't know the correlation. What? I don't know the correlation. 
Yeah, but in principle, if you, so if you, I mean, in principle, for instance, you can measure it experimentally. Suppose you knew that. So this is laying out the the, the procedure. So the procedure, I mean, you can work backwards, right? You you you, you say if this is a correlation, this is a property, and then you can work backwards. Do I know that I am approaching Why I'm doing it? Yeah. If, if you find that the things are becoming local at that scale, then you have approached like. Beyond that, things will be local. So, now here's an important thing. So, by local, I mean that the correlation lengths will be local. I'm not talking about, ah, so here's an important point. The Hamiltonian the, of the initial theory was local. Why is it local? Because we assumed it's local. Because you don't know what the initial Hamiltonian is, that's an assumption. You assume that physics is described by a local fundamental Hamiltonian. So your initial Hamiltonian is assumed to be local. So when I say local now, I mean local on a length scale L0. Because this interacts with that, so the length scale is L0. Now you do an RG transformation and you get H1 here. And H1 should be local on a length scale of 2L0. Okay. So if your initial Hamiltonian is local on a length scale L0, after this averaging, you should get a Hamiltonian which is local on a scale of 2L0. If you get a Hamiltonian which is has uh, scale 1000 L0, that's not useful. That there's something wrong with your procedure. Because if you believe that physics is local, so the, Hamil the procedure should give you at every stage a local Hamiltonian on whatever length scale it is. So you get a Hamiltonian H1 which is local at 2L0. Okay. And you keep iterating this procedure H2 till you get Hn in which the spacing between the two degrees of freedom is precisely the correlation length or of that order. Then I don't have to do any more coarse graining. I don't have to do any more averaging because now uh, uh, it's not going to change much because there is you. It, it, then the problem becomes local and that scale. Okay, so you reach the correlation length and that. So this procedure of starting from the fundamental thing to getting a Hamiltonian, which is local on the scale of the correlation length, is the RG transformation. And what we have to work out is how to do this. Uh, and of course, it goes without saying that very often <laughs> this each step will involve making approximations if you want to make it manageable. But once again, as I said, the, when you do, if you do it exactly, the exact RG will be exact. But otherwise, in practice, uh, you always have to make approximations. Huh? No, no, no. It's see, the, you, we are not changing the physics of the problem. So you have a situation where the correlation length at some TC is say T is slightly less than TC where the correlation length is I don't know uh, 10,000 angstroms or something. You're not changing that. Physics is invariant. It's just the Hamiltonian you, you use uh, is not at the atomic scale but at the scale of which in which the uh, elements are separated by order of the distances of order so correlation length. Yeah. Yes, yes. Hamiltonian is, Hamiltonian is local, but there are long distance correlations. So, see, in the case of the, you have to, re, even in the case of the water molecule, you realize that the fundamental Lagrangian standard model or something is a local thing, right? It's the interactions which are effectively generating correlations of a length scale. So, the correlations of this are non local uh, on the scale. But it doesn't mean that the fundamental Hamiltonian of the world is non-local. Fundamental Hamiltonian of the world is a standard model, let's say, which is local theory. But you, you build it up. So at every stage, the idea is you should maintain that locality and come up to the correlation length that you're interested in. So you will get in this, so if you do this for water, you will get a hydrodynamic theory where the parameters in your equation will have been determined from the fundamental model by the series of transformations. 
and you'll end up with some equations of hydrodynamics in this case. Okay. HN doesn't have more information than H0. It has, if anything, it has less information. But the point is, it's in a more convenient form. We will have some exam. Yeah, the whole course is about explicitly. So this is the outline. So we'll do it explicitly for the uh, spin cis. Okay. So this is the issue of reducing number of degrees of freedom. The second issue is. Uh, uh, you have to after when you do all this, you you expect some uh, the effects of what is called cooperative behavior. You will see the effects of cooperative behavior and more. Uh, so, for instance, okay. So let me uh, say a little bit about that. So let's uh, this iteration scheme. You call it some tau. Okay. So you, the, the procedure that you follow is the same at every stage. So you start with one H0 and you get H1. You start with this H1, which is your coarse graining scheme is the same, and you get H2. And you keep going like that. So tau of Hn is some Hn plus 1. Now typically what will happen is that you will get a fixed point. Things don't change anymore. Okay, So you get some tau of h star equals h star. You get something like that. And once you get this kind of behavior, a lot of interesting things happen. One of the things that happens if, if when you get a behavior like this, for instance, is that the solution of this h star is a property of tau. Okay, It's not a property of h naught. The pro I mean, it is in some sense a property of H0, but not in not in its detail. I mean, some details of H0 will of course be there, but the details of H0 are not going to be important in determining H star because uh, this equation has no direct reference to H0. So the properties of your fixed point Hamiltonian are essentially uh, independent of details of the parameters of H0. Okay? So this this behavior is called universality. Which means if I start with H0 and a slightly different H0, qualitatively the same but with some, let's say, differences in some parameters, you will still end up with the same H, H star. So your final uh, long distance, the Hamiltonian that you work for long distance phenomena are not going to be, dif not going to be different. You will get the same phenomenon. This is a phenomenon of universality which is observed. Which, what is universality? You have a wide number, different materials show the same critical behavior at the critical point. Okay? So the behavior uh, at happens when C goes to infinity is the same for a wide range of materials. And that is something uh, observed experimentally. And the RG gives a nice uh, explanation for that. The way it does it is by saying that the properties of that critical uh, behavior, uh, phase transition, is decided by the properties of this H star, which is property of this map. And a lot of details of the original H naught are not important. Okay. What else do I have to say? Ah, so as a complication, you might find many fixed points. So you might find uh, fixed point a finite number of fixed points, you will find H A, then you might find another fixed point H B and so on. So you might find a discrete number of fixed points and in that case your universality hypothesis will have to be modified. So you will say that if you are in the neighborhood of this fixed point, there will be one universal behavior, in the neighborhood of the other fixed point there will be some other universal behavior and which fixed point you reach will de be determined by your starting uh, Hamiltonian. So typically what will happen is uh, you, you start with your Hamiltonian H0, you change some parameter and for a range of values you will end up with the same fixed point. That means things don't depend on that parameter. Okay? And then you will find a range where things depend dramatically on that parameter 
and you go to a new phase where uh, the fixed point is that. Okay, so you, you, in other words, say that this is one fixed point, this is one fixed point, you start somewhere here and let's say you flow to this and you start somewhere here and you flow to this. There is some region here which if you cross, you will suddenly flow to that. So up to here, there is what Wilson calls a de-amplification, which means the changes from here to here don't affect the final result, the de-amplified. But when you go from here to here, whatever change you made is amplified because instead of going here, you go there. The small change here gets amplified to going there versus going there. So that's typically the behavior. So these kind of things are observed experimentally and this whole analysis provides a simple conceptual framework for understanding this. Okay. Yes, the starting Hamiltonian, yes. It's very similar, yeah, yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, so in, so if you are in this region, you can say that things become, it's like, yeah, so it's like when you are uh, in, in, typically in systems with chaos, you change your initial condition a bit, there is a exponential change in the final state, final set, uh, variable, and this is, that's, that's roughly what happens here. So it's like the Lyapunov exponent being positive that region, whereas other places it gets de-amplified and goes to zero. Okay, what else do I have to say? Yeah, so uh, the summary of all this, let me just summarize before we uh, proceed. So the summary is one, this issue of the correlation length and how things become local on scales larger than the correlation length. So in ordinary systems like hydrodynamics, there is some well-defined range beyond which things become local. Critical phenomena, that does not happen because it is infinite. So all length scales are important and it is very hard to make this hydrodynamic kind of simple, naive, take the naive continuum limit. And the root cause is the fluctuation. So that is what Wilson calls the statistical continuum limit. Every variable, every field, every at every point in X, there is a fluctuating field, fluctuating degree of freedom. And uh, so it is like an con infinite continuous number of fields, not just a continuous number of points. Okay? And there is no one wavelength, unlike in hydrodynamics, there is no one wavelength that is important, one length scale that is important all length scales are important, there is no separation of scales. So the technique for doing this, tackling problems of this scale is the RG technique and as I said the basic idea in RG is this, namely you reduce the degrees of freedom not in one shot but in stages, in steps. In fact this number 2 is arbitrary, you can make it 3, you can make it 1.2, you can make it infinitesimal. If you do it in an infinitesimal way, say 1, point, 1 plus epsilon, then you have a continuous motion. Okay? This is like a discrete going discrete cell, but you can do it in a continuous motion also. And uh, the idea is that it, you start with a local Hamiltonian at each stage, you continue get a local Hamiltonian with slightly different properties, but with the length scale twice the original one. This one will give you a, again a local Hamiltonian with length scale twice the old one, which so it's four times the first one, and so on, till you get a Hamiltonian whose length scale is large enough that it's equal to the correlation length, and then you are basically done. That Hamiltonian is convenient to work with, okay? Because you can write down. Once you have that Hamiltonian, you can do what is done in hydrodynamics. There's no further scales to worry about. Uh, so this is the procedure and what, what happens, one of the uh, things that happen, uh, output of the result of all this is this, what is called the cooperative behavior, namely uh, when you have a large number of degrees of freedom, there is some universality about the behavior, which nowadays people call it emergent behavior, which is independent of a lot of the microscopic details. So that is the universality and then the notion of fixed points which decide the, the universal properties of that 
that uh, critical point. So that's uh, sort of a introduction, conceptual introduction to what RG does and what we have to do. So what we are going to do is to study, start with some simple sit situations, uh, keeping in mind this we, that we want to study a critical phenomenon. So we will be on a lattice to begin with and we want to study situations where c goes to infinity and we will start with some simple uh, traditional methods. We will start with the, something like mean field theory which gives you some results and then we will do the simplest RG for what is called the Gaussian model which is actually free field theory and then we will go on to more complicated things. So at this point what I will do is I will sort of list roughly the topics that are going to come so you get an idea of where we are headed. So I'm going to erase this. So these are the topics. Okay, first the introduction was already done. So the first topic is the, uh, I should say, mean field and the Gaussian model. So maybe I'll just do mean field today and do that uh, next class. Uh, then the, so the Gaussian model, as I said, what in field theory you would just call a free field theory. So it spins with just uh, nearest neighbor interactions. It just there's just a term. If S is your spin, there's just a term S squared in your Hamiltonian quadratic. Then the S4 model. So that's a non-trivial model. So that in ordinary field theory is what we call the lambda phi four theory, what Wilson calls the S4 model. But this we're doing all this on the lattice. So it's like it spins. Okay. Uh, so we'll do the RG transformations for this model. We'll do the RG for that also, but it'll be fairly trivial. Nothing much happens. And then uh, there's a famous epsilon expansion for this model. And the epsilon is a small parameter. In Wilson's case, he studied it in, uh, he chose it to be D minus 4 where d is the space-time dimension and what he did was to generalize, since you can write down a uh, formula in terms of d for d dimensions, you say that d is a f not an uh, integer but a real number different from 4 and he did an expansion in epsilon and then at the end of the day what he was interested in, but for him d uh, was the spatial dimension, okay, he's interested in a three-dimensional uh, system, uh, the um, equilibrium properties, uh, finite temperature for three dimensional system. So time is not, it's just three space dimensions. So he wants D to be three. So um, you choose epsilon to be one or, well if it's D minus four, it's uh, minus one, four minus D is one depending on the sign. So in this epsilon expansion, you will find a fixed point. H star. Uh, then you perturb about the fixed point. And you can study, you can define the various kinds of perturbation, the what is called the marginal, the relevant, and irrelevant, the three kinds of perturbations about the fixed point. And then the next topic is scaling and universality. So near the fixed point, so you know in uh, people who do study phase transitions, they define various critical exponents and near the fixed point because of this additional hypothesis of what is called scaling, you can relate the different uh, uh, exponents. And all this comes out naturally 
from the RG. It used to be a phenomenological theory, the scaling and universality becomes rigorous from the RG point of view. Uh, what else? Um, and then the topology of RG. So this is this business about what you have when you have different fixed points and how you flow and this will be crucial for understanding the continuum limit. So this is of particular interest to field to people who do particle physics and field theory because you want to take the continuum limit. But in a practical sense it is also uh, relevant for people who do uh, critical phenomena because you would like to take lambda to be very the, the lattice spacing to be very small compared to your physical length scale. So for all practical purposes it is a continuum. But it is uh, but for particle physics this is dead serious you, 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 act, you have to take the continuum limit or so we believe now maybe we do not but um, ah, and this point so this is um, the if you reach this far you understood the basics of RG. Now the RG that you do in field theory slightly different. You study beta functions, then you study the Karen semantic equation and so on. So those are techniques that are used in the continuum and um, here we have not said anything about that but we will try to make contact with that. So this will, so the kalin semantic equation or gelman low RG equations were actually historically the first, first way, first place where RG entered in physics. Uh, but now uh, this understanding came after that. But when you when you actually do calculations in field theory, you go back to kalin semantic. I mean, you don't do all this when you're doing a field theory calculation. Where is this useful? This is really useful first to understand conceptually what is happening and second when you want to do when you want to go beyond perturbation theory beyond Feynman diagrams and you want to do things exactly for instance on a numerically on a lattice you have to have this conceptual framework. Okay. So the continuum techniques just involve using Feynman diagrams and so on that those techniques are very powerful for perturbation theory and we won't say much about that except to make contact with it. Okay, at this point we so top number eight. Then I'll talk about the more some more recent developments. So one development uh, is uh, Polchinski's equation. So Polchinski wrote down a version of Wilson's. So the exact. Uh, Wilson and his review has an exact RG equation and in fact he says that in future the future work in this area will probably dip, will use this equation a lot. He does not in those days it was not used. Then Polchinski wrote down a, a, a version of that a simplified version of that and he used that to prove uh, the perturbative renormalizability of lambda phi 4 and the proof is much simpler than the usual proofs of renormalizability. So it, it had some shall I say sociological impact on on the field theory community. So it's very so and it, it's a very useful form of the equation. In fact I'll use this a lot. Um, so I should say yeah so here there's also the Polchinski then there's Wilson and uh, you so you can write down an exact equation for fixed point. rather than an approximate equation and you can try and solve for that equation order by order. So then more uh, recent developments things uh, there is something called a functional RG and um, so, we, uh, uh, so RG is usually written for the action. The functional RG is something written for something 
like the effective action, there's a effective action that we define that that gives you the one particular reducible graphs in field theory, and this is an RG for that. So this is all things that we'll, we'll do in the end towards the end of the course. And then there's this notion of composite operators and symmetries. How do you how do you impose symmetry? So you have symmetries like Poincaré invariance or some SON symmetry, various symmetries, Lorentz invariance. How do you impose it? At, a, at the level of the exact RG. I mean, you want, to, you want these symmetries to be exact. You see, the thing is, when you do RG, you always have a cutoff. So everything is well defined rigorously. There's no problem. There's no divergence, nothing. And if you, want to, uh, if you want to impose your symmetries properly, you have to do it in the framework of the RG. The continuum is always very misleading. So you should start with a finite cut off and then try to take the cut off to infinity that's the correct way to do it and in the process you learn you learn a lot and this is this is basically uh, if we if you have time I'll talk a little bit about holographic this is a connection in string theory this is ADS CFT correspondence where uh, there's something called the holographic R renormalization group. And if you have time, we'll talk a little bit about that. So this is basically the outline of the course. I don't know how long it'll take, but I definitely I'll try to finish in maybe six weeks or two months max. OK, any questions? Then I'll start with the first topic. Yes. Oh, so it means you s you get a Hamiltonian, and you apply the RG transformation to it, you get back the same Hamiltonian. Nothing changes. Your parameters don't change. So it's like the coupling constant, which usually runs, doesn't change. All the parameters, none of the parameters change. It's not just, I mean, literally there are an infinite number of coupling constants for the exact theory and all of them are at well defined values. Okay, so maybe I'll right here. So I'll stop at twelve thirty. So what I want to do to now is talk about uh, This idea of Kadanoff So the, the intuitive idea, this change from L0 to L0, the idea of combining, uh, changing a Hamiltonian, combining spins, was called blocking, and that was introduced by Kadanoff. So I'll just before, but uh, so let me first talk about before you do RG. What is the situation? So we have mean field theory. How did people study critical phenomena? They had mean field field theory, and uh, the issue uh, is what Wilson calls the search for analyticity. See, when, when you have a phase transition, you expect that, so if T is your temperature, as T goes to Tc, Tc is your critical temperature, various quantities diverge, okay, infinite, things become infinite, correlation length goes to infinity, specific heat may diverge. So these are non-analytic behavior. Okay. If you want to get non-analytic behavior, you can't get it from a finite number of degrees of freedom. If you have 1,000 spins, you will never get anything non-analytic. Everything will be analytic. So clearly, you need to take an infinite volume limit, infinite number of degrees of freedom to get non-analyticity. However, uh, when you have an infinite number of degrees of freedom, all kinds of things will start diverging because you're, you're doing infinite sums. 
so you, you your the, the the analytic the non analyticity you want is only as t goes to tc nothing else so you want to start with things which are analytic away from tc even when you have an infinite number of degrees of freedom and get the non analyticity at t equals tc so um, some kind of this you can get us in some sense in mean field theory and I will just outline that for a minute. So let us start with a, um, so okay, so this I will write this down because this is what we are going to use all the time. So this is spins like an Ising model, this is the sites of the lattice n and n plus i are neighboring sites and you can depending on the dimension you sum over all the neighbors there's a weight k which is some j by kt so that's a partition function minus sign yeah you, you can put j as minus okay if you want to put minus sign And this is sum over all sites and are all all SNs. So at each site, SN. So if it's an Ising spin, it'll take value plus one, minus one, but it could be also a continuous variable. So whatever that is, that's what it is. Okay. So we we want to see how how can you get non-analyticity as t goes to tc. So how does it work in mean field theory? So in mean field theory, we have uh, some free energy function so m so this is some free energy m is the magnetization t is the temperature and uh, we will we'll use h as some external magnetic field so this is just elementary stuff that you all know about. I'm just I want to emphasize the the, the non-analyticity part. So we write what what is typically done is to write down uh, some function like this. Plus some u of t. For instance, so this is your Landau, Ginzburg, M is a magnetization, you expect some free energy behavior. Okay. So if you plot this uh, as a function of M, this typically will have two kinds of behavior, either like this or like this, two possibilities. Which possibility is realized depends on the sign of this. Okay. If RT is negative, you have this possibility. This is RT less than zero. RT, this is RT greater than zero. Two possibilities. If you are in this position, so this is let's say the zero. So the, if you are in this situation, your minimum is here, and you have a so this we're plotting um, M. And this is G. So if you are in this situation, your minimum has some non zero M. So the situation has the system spontaneously magnetizes. If you are here, M is zero, the system is not magnetized. So RT clearly greater than zero corresponds to the high temperature phase where there is no magnetization, RT less than zero corresponds to the low temperature phase where there is magnetization. So the simplest assumption is to say that RT goes as T minus TC. Hope that's the right sign. Yeah. So when T is greater than TC, you have that. T less than TC, you have that. Is that clear? So this this coefficient, because you want this to be analytic. Uh, yeah. So you if you plot, you, you want to minimize the free energy to find M. So, if if R T happens to be greater than zero, your potential will be like this. So this is let's say I should put this at the origin of the axis. So this is my axis. So here is M is zero. 
okay so assume no external magnetization uh, and here m is non zero so that's what happens in a ferromagnet when you are below the phase transition you expect non zero m above the phase transition you expect zero m so but this curve you get this curve and rt is greater than zero this has to be greater than zero you get this curve and rt is less than zero so it has to change sign from one to the other at tc because above tc it should go to one and below tc it should go to the other so it must be proportional to t minus tc some odd power so this is consistent with analyticity you have an an uh, sorry yeah it's just a coefficient of the quadratic GMT, yeah, this is, yeah, it's just you want some uh, analytic function of M, polynomial. You can go on and then you can justify it later on, on grounds of, uh, so originally it's, it's just uh, simplest possible dependence on M is this. It's a model. Yeah. Which, uh, so this is written originally by I guess Landau and Ginzburg to describe this kind of phenomena. Okay. So only the minimum of that is relevant. Yes, for this for this calculation. So I'm not uh, doing mean field theory in detail. I just want to show you the the dependence on t uh, t minus t c. Okay. So now if you solve for this, so d g you will find that the magnetization m is uh, you can just minimize it it's basically minus rt by 2 ut okay so this is basically tc minus t so i'm just solving for m as a function of rt and you see there's a square root so you get this non-analyticity starting from a uh, analytic Hamiltonian and uh, this actually gives you one of those exponents that people define it gives you half okay. and you can uh, find chi the susceptibility and you find oh. and you find that chi is basically 1 over rt which I, it's this is basically uh, dm by dh or inverse of dh by dm so this is uh, dg by dm is h this is your magnetic field when h is 0 you get uh, uh, equal to 0 and you solve this you can calculate dm by dh from this and invert it and calculate chi and you get rt and this comes out to be of course 1 by t minus tc so again as t, t goes to tc there is a non analyticity and this gives another exponent which is gamma equals 1 and the other thing you can immediately you can't see in this you can't see it in this form but if you think of this as a field theory uh, we'll, this is like a mass term for the field you s I hope you can see that right? phi squared this is a mass term and uh, if you make m a function of x suppose m is here m is just a constant but suppose you make m a function of x you can do a more sophisticated analysis and calculate the correlation function between two points and you'll find that the correlation length is basically 1 over m so this r this is like the mass squared in field theory so the correlation length goes 1 over m so it's 1 over square root uh, Okay. 
So again, you see the divergence as t goes to tc. So this is a non analytic that that you expect in critical phenomena. And uh, this gives you an exponent nu equals half. So what have we done here? I've just uh, shown you how you get these critical exponents which people are looking for for the universal behavior in mean field theory. So where have where is the information that you are at a phase transition and you need an infinite number of degrees of freedom? Well, the point is, unless you have an infinite number of degrees of freedom, your field is not going to sit at the minimum. Okay? If you have a finite number of degrees of freedom, there will be thermal fluctuations and this kind of symmetry breaking will never happen. Okay? So it is implicit in this analysis that you have you have gone to an infinite volume limit, number of degrees of freedom is infinite and you are going to sit at the minimum there. If you are in atomic physics for instance, you are not going to sit there. You will go into some linear combination of these two states, you will tunnel back and forth and your expectation value will be 0. Right? That is what happens in quantum mechanics, we have two well potential. Your expectation value for is still 0. But when you have an infinite number of degrees of freedom, you sit at the minimum and uh, then you can get this kind of behavior. So, the fact that the number of degrees of freedom is infinite is built into this. That is why you are able to get this non analyticity and you are starting with an analytic Hamiltonian. Okay. So, this is the simplest uh, way in which the critical exponents can be obtained and what RG does is to improve this to do it more exactly. Okay. We will take into account all the fluctuations and everything. So, let us do that and uh, oh okay. Maybe I'll stop. It's 12:30. So what I this is so all I've done today is just introduce the basic ideas of RG and uh, the notion of a correlation length and how and the, the fact that it diverges and that's where RG is important. What I want to do uh, tomorrow is to start with uh, the Kadanoff blocking and study the Gaussian model. We'll go through the sequence one by one. Okay, so I guess we'll stop here.